Today, we're going to be learning Ta'ani Daf Yud Zayin. This week's learning is sponsored by Rivka and Martin Himmel in honor of Hanukkah. Um, on that note, I'll wish everybody a Hanukkah Sameach. Today's stuff is also sponsored by Carol Robinson and Arthur Gould in loving memory of Carol's father, Louis Robinson. Yehuda Leib ben Moshe Zichronol Levracha. Today, the first day of Hanukkah, we mark his second year at site. Lou is devoted to his family and his synagogue. We love him and miss him very much. Okay, we're going to start at the top of Yud Zayin Amr Aleph. We saw in the Mishnah that on the first blessing, they would say, whoever answered Avraham, he should write, which really means God. God who answered Avraham should remember all of us and answer our prayers. So now, and then it went through. Each one had a different person associated with it and a different ending to the blessing. So we're going to have a few brightos that discuss this. Tana, a brighto says, Yesh machlifim tzakala Eliyahu utfila l'shmuel. Bracha number three was about Shmuel, and it ended with the he who heard Shmuel when he cried out at Mitzpah, and the people were fighting against the police team, and they were losing, and he called out in prayer. And there it says the bracha for that blessing is Shomea tzaka, God heard our cries. When it comes to Eliyahu, it says Eliyahu at Hara Carmel when he fought against the the Baal, the Nevi'e Habal, the prophets of the Avodah Sarah, he said there, um, he prayed, just like he was answered, also our prayer should be answered. Baruch Hashem that. That was bracha number four. God will hear our prayers. So this hear our cries with Shmuel and hear our prayers with Eliyahu. So the bright here says, some people switch they associate Tvila with Shmuel, and they associate cry with Eliyahu, to which the Gemara says, let's try to figure this out. By Shmuel, I understand. By Shmuel, it appears both the language of crying and the language of prayer. How so? So Rashi tells us in the Dibor HaMathil, where it starts off the words are bolded, okay, skip down a bit over there, about three lines. It says, Ki et kol Yisrael ha-mitzpata ve-et palel ba'adchem. That's the language of prayer. And Sa'aka, it says, Vayichar l'shmuel vayizak el Hashem kol alayla. He cried out to God all night. So there you he, see that you can interchange, whether it's Sa'aka, a cry, or a prayer. But those are both in the same section, which happened in mitzpah. But when it comes to Ela, Kabe Eliyahu, Tfilaktiv, Tzakaloktiv, it says prayer, it doesn't say cry. No, it really doesn't say either. It says, as Rashi tells us in the next Rashi, Kabe Eliyahu, Bema said to Hara Kamel, Ktiv, Tfilah, Dichtiv, Aneni, Hashem, Aneni. Answer me, please, Hashem, answer me. Now, what does that mean? That sounds like a prayer. Saying, please answer me, it sounds like a prayer. So now the Gemara answers, ah, you could say, Aneni, Hashem, Aneni, Lashon, Tzakai. You could, it's all a matter of your tone of voice. Right? I just hear my mother saying, it's all a matter of how you say things, not what you say, but how you say them. You could say, Aneinu Hashem, Aneinu, cry out, and you know, have this cry to God. And it wasn't the best cry of mine, but you could cry out to God in the language of Aneinu, and therefore it could be called a tzaka. And I guess that's the debate, whether the tzaka is associated with, with uh, well, or the tzaka is associated with Eliyahu. On the sixth blessing, he says, Misha'ana Yona, this is Yona, Jonah in the whale, or in the fish. Now we said when we learned the mission that the order is a little out of place. Right? Not only is Yona before David and Shlomo, but even Eliyahu is. Our Gemara doesn't ask about that, but that's because our answer is going to resolve any question you might have um, about that. And also the Yushami, they asked specifically about Eliyahu, same thing. But if we're going chronologically, which it seemed like we were going, some things are appear out of order. So Michti Yona Batar David Shlomo Hava, since Yona came after David and Shlomo, my time I'm Machdim Lebereisha. So why do they come first? Why does uh, Yona come first? Mishum Debai Lemichta Merachem Ala Aves. The reason is we want to end with God has mercy on the land. Therefore, we want to end with David and Shlomo. What do they have to do with the land? So first of all, you could actually answer by saying that Yonah has nothing to do with the land because he was in the water. And maybe that's why. It's a possibility. But it really wouldn't explain why David and Shlomo and not anybody else. So Rashi tries to give an explanation. Rashi says in Debai Lamechtam, a little bit further on, he says, they daven for Eretz Israel. Okay, alternatively, because they built the Bainamik Dash, and therefore, right, David started anyway, and Shlomo really did the building. 
And that's Ikar Haaretz. That's the main thing in the land. Rashi says, Kach Shamati, that's what I heard, which seems to indicate that he might not be convinced by this, but this is what he got by tradition, but it's obviously a little tricky to figure out why they're associated with the land. Okay, so Rashi gives some explanations, but still a little bit tricky. Next. Tana Mishum Sumchu Samru. There's a Brighton now that says, in the name of Sumchu Samru, or I should read it Tana, there's a Brighton. Mishum Sumchu Samru, in the name of Sumchu, they said, Baruch Mashpil Haramim. The bracha is in Baruch Machem al Aretz, God who has mercy on the land. It's Baruch is the God who lowers the people who are arrogant. Now, both Shlomo and David had moments where they were arrogant, okay, maybe more than one, but David, it said that he counted the people, which is considered not a good thing did the census, and then there was a plague, and then he called out to God and was forgiven. Shlomo, it's not as clear cut, but it seems Shlomo, um, there was a, sorry, lose me for one second. Shlomo, they say it was, um, as soon as I see it, I'll remember, but let me find it. Yeah, so Shlomo, ah, right. He says, Bano baniti beit zvula. Okay, it's a little tricky. It's not exactly arrogance, but it says, I built you your house, right? Where it's almost like saying, right, I am the greatest because look, I built the house of God. I built the temple. So then he gets punished. God sends enemies against him, the king of Aram and other enemies, and they fight against him. And then Shmua, uh, Shlomo calls out for help. God helps him. And that's what we're assuming has to do with Baruch Mashpil Havamim, that he later, right, was put down and therefore, and then got forgiveness. Shalosh, so that's why we want to end with that concept, because that's an important concept, right? One of the main things is, is being arrogant, and we want, right? The question is why we want to end with Marachem al Aretz. That's because we're having a problem with the land, because the rain's not coming. And Baruch Mashpil Ramim is obviously the, associated with the fact that we assume one of the biggest sins of people is arrogance, and then, you know, not feeling like God has connection in my life. What do I need God for? I'm, I could do everything myself which is exactly the antithesis, right? The rain and the prayers for the rain is supposed to challenge that whole assumption that one might make that I'm in charge. No, it's really God that's in charge. So it's a very central theme of our Masechet. Shalosh ta'aniyot ha'rishono. Anshem mishmar mitanim velo mashlimim. The first three fasts, now we're back to the koanim that we discussed in the Mishnah. The people whose job it is to be on duty that week, they fast, but they don't finish their fast, right? And then we had distinguish between them and the people actually in the Beit Av were actually working. And they were going to be even more lenient with them. So Tanu Rabbanan. Remember what the Mishmar was. The Mishmar is, um, the Mishmar are people who, uh, the Kohanim, there were 24 groups of Kohanim. And they would go and they would uh, be in charge that week. And within that, they had, each one had a day that they worked. That was the bait of the family specifically within that. So why the Anshay Mishmar, this was another thing it said in the Mishnah, can drink wine at night, but not during the day. And it's theoretically, you might think you're not working that day. You could drink wine, but what's the issue? Maybe the people on duty that day might need extra help. They might need to bring in the reserves. So you're in reserve, you're on call, therefore you can't drink at all. I had to think of my daughter in the army who is on call at certain points. She has to always be available, right? It's not really, nothing's different right then, but in case you get called right away, you'll have to go. So, you know, you have to be ready. So same thing here, you have to be ready, but they might call you in. Why do they say that the Beit Av can't do it, can't drink not during the day and not at night? They're always working, even at night. There's no real temple worship done, but there are things that need to be done in the temple that need to be finished up from the day. Some people say it's not really the day after, the night after, it's the night before. And that we're worried that if you get too drunk, you won't be able to wake up in the morning. You'll be still drunk in the morning. And therefore, and then there was a big practical difference between the two approaches is, which night are they not allowed to drink? The night before they work or the night after they work? From here they say, Everyone who knows, any Kohen who now knows. Now, the assumption is we're talking about once there's no longer a temple. Although some people claim this is referring in the time of the temple, but someone who's actually not working that, that week, but knows that it's their job to work for whatever reason, they're not going to the temple. So they say any coin who knows what their mishmar is, and they know what their mishmar is, they know what family they are within that. 
and they know what day they're supposed to be work, what they're supposed to work. They knew exactly when their fathers were supposed to be on the job. Assuming, let's just assume we go with the interpretation. This is after the destruction of the temple, and you still keep track of what family you're from. You can't drink wine that day. Why? Maybe the Beit HaMikdash will be rebuilt and you'll have to go to the temple and you'll be drunk. You'll have a big problem. So that day you're not allowed to go. But now what if Makir Mishmar Tova ain Makir Mishmeret Beit Av Shalom? What if you know what Mishmar you are? You know what your week is, but you don't know which day you have. Somebody knew that his father's work there. Asur Lishtot Kol Otah Shabbat. You can't drink the entire week that your family is supposed to be there. Okay, that's not terrible yet, but wait. This would basically cover most Kwanim our days. I assume nobody really knows where they descend from anymore. And this basically says, okay, don't worry if you're a Kohen. Well, there's, there's some hope at the end of the sugya, but it sounds like you can't drink at all because you never know. The Beit HaMikdash could be rebuilt and you'll have to go straight to work. And you don't know what week it is, what week your, your job, what week you're supposed to be working, so you can't drink all year long. Rebbe Omer, Omer Ani, Asur the Shoyayin Lo'olam. He says, theoretically, I would say you really can't drink wine forever. Okay, forget about Kol Shana, right? Not just every year, it's all the time. However, Ava, but, big but here. Ma'ese, what can I do? Sheta Kanato, Kil Kalato. His Takana is fixing it is his destruction. Okay, this is a very unclear statement. And I'm going to give you four different ways of explaining this, which he's basically, what he's trying to say is it's no longer valid. But why is he saying it's no longer valid? What's the kilkala? What's the takana? So some people say the fact that the mikdash was destroyed works to his advantage. Okay, and the fact that the mikdash has been destroyed for many years and hasn't yet been rebuilt. So Therefore, there's a less of a likelihood that it's really going to be rebuilt. This is Rav, by the way, first generation of Moraim. We're not talking so much longer after the Chorban, right? Like 150 years. 150 years is a long time. It's already past the 70 from the first temple. And you can see that they're almost losing hope if you go by that interpretation that the temple will be rebuilt immediately. And therefore, we don't really need to live in this any second it might be rebuilt. And therefore, the Kainim can drink. That's one option. One is... Because there's no temple at all, we don't need to do this. You know, it's, one is past, there's no temple. One is the Kilkala, is that the temple hasn't been rebuilt. And that is the Takana for the Kohanim that they now are allowed to drink. Third option is to say that the ignorance of the Kohanim, the fact that they have no idea is actually going to work to their advantage. Why is that? Because when the temple is rebuilt, it'll take a while till they figure out who's supposed to work what day. So by the time they figure all that, if you really were drunk, you won't be drunk anymore. And the fourth option is to say that maybe this is going to lead to your downfall and that, that the impossibility of you of having all koanim not drink, right? I'm thinking of my family, my parents, my brothers, they're all koanim. You know, theoretically, it would mean they can't ever drink wine. Now, that's something that's very hard for, not for everybody, but for some people, it's hard for them to keep up with, right? To, to basically never drink wine. Sounds crazy. So basically, for that reason, he says, since it's an impossible task. So takanato kil kalato, the fact that no one can really stand up for this is going to be the takana, is going to be why you're actually allowed to do it. Okay. So very interesting approaches as to why, right, they all have interesting ramifications, like just because people can't hold up to something, that means we don't, we don't, you know, make a prohibition. Um, again, we, this is only a rabbinic prohibition because it's, there's no temple anymore. So the issue is we're concerned maybe temple will be rebuilt. So we can be more lenient about that if people really can't keep up with it. If we say that we no longer really believe that the Beit HaMikdash is going to be rebuilt immediately, right? And even Rob was saying that, that's interesting because it's always one of these things that's hard for us to grapple with. Right? Do we really feel, right? Does everybody feel every day that tomorrow the temple might be rebuilt or today it might be rebuilt? Hard to feel that way, certainly after so many years have passed. So you see that Rav himself said that again, if you go with that interpretation, at least one of the commentaries thought that Rav said that. Okay, let's move on. And she mishmar, and she ma'amad, asurim l'saperu l'chabes. They can't cut their hair and they can't wash their clothes. Uba chamishim utarim ipnek for Shabbat, only on Thursday they're allowed to because of Shabbat. My time, huh? Amar rabba barachan, amar rabbi yochad, an kadesh alayi kansu l'mishmartam kashahem enuvalim. We don't want them, and as you would think, on the, on the other hand, you should be able to. You want to look nice when you're on the job. But the point is, 
We want them to go into it. Now, when we say you can't cut your hair all week, that will make you cut your hair before, right? How many people get their hair cut right before the three weeks or right before Svirata Omer? Because you know, and I'm notorious, I for, always forget to cut my hair. But when, when I know that it's going to be a month that I won't be able to cut my hair, so then I get my act together and I get a haircut. It's the same thing here. Since they know they won't be able to. And you can't do laundry. So you're going to make sure to do all your laundry before. Tanu Rabbanan. Now there's another bright. It tells you about people and how often certain people cut their hair. Melech mistapel b'chol yom. King cuts his hair every single day. Kohen gadol me'erev Shabbat la'erev Shabbat. He does it every once a week on Erev Shabbat. Um, Kohen hediot, a regular Kohen, echad l'shloshim yom, once every 30 days. So now we're going to see why. Melech mistapel b'chol yom. Why? My time, huh? What's the reason? Amar rabbi am barzavda, amar kra, melech b'yofyo techezena enecha. You should always be looking at a king in his glory. The king should always look glorious, I'm sure. That there's people, kings, heads of heads of countries that get their hair cut every day. I'm certain, right? Kohen gadol, erev Shabbat la'erev Shabbat. My time. What's the reason? I'm a Rav Shmuel bar Yitzchak. Ho'ilu mishmarot mitchad show. That's the day on Shabbat. Every all the mishmarot switch. Okay, this one comes in, that one goes out. So they all, when they walk in, they see the kohen gadol for the first time, and they haven't seen him in a while, and they want you to see something unbelievable looking. So they want him to have a nice haircut when the new Mishmar comes and sees him. Next, Kohen Ediyot Echad L'Shloshim Yom. Minala, where do we get this from? Atya Pera Pera Minazir. We're going to see there's same word appears by Nazir, same word appears by Kohen and cutting hair. And therefore, we're going to learn one from the other. We're going to have to figure out where we learn Nazir's 30 days. We'll get to that after. This is a pasuk not from the Torah, but from Yechezka. It talks about the Kohanim, and it says they shouldn't shave their heads. Okay, you can't cut your hair completely, but you also, you shouldn't let your hair go wild. So therefore, Kohen has to cut his hair. It says by the Nazir, He will be sanctified, and he should grow his hair long. What does it mean to grow your hair long? How long does he grow his hair? For 30 days, the Nazir. We'll see how we know that in a minute. So therefore, the Kohen, when he can't grow his hair long, we're going to assume that means 30 days. So now the Gemara says, Where do we learn the Nazir from? Average Nazirut is 30 days. If you just say, I'm going to be a Nazir, and you don't specify how long, we assume 30 days. The default. Minalam, where do we get that from? Amakra Yihiye. He read Kadosh Yihiye, he will be holy. And then it says she should grow his hair. So Yihiye Bigamatria, Yud and Yud is 20, He and He is 10, gets to 30. So that's how we learn Talton Have, that's 30 days. Amrale Rapapa Labai. Papa says Tabai, Dilmahaki Kama Rahmana, Loli or Buklao. When the Torah says, don't let your hair grow. Maybe that means don't let it grow at all. It means cut it every single day. So they say, Abai answers him, it says, don't send your hair to be wild. That might mean make sure every single day to cut it. But it starts at the word para and then says, and don't do it. Right? Para again means grow your hair wild, but don't do that. So they understand it. Means you can grow your hair, just don't let it grow too long. And that's where they get this. We're going to limit it, but not every single day. Now wait, if this is a whole thing for Kani, then it should be relevant even nowadays. Just like we said with the wine is relevant. This should also be relevant nowadays. Why, right? So now they say, right? Wait a minute. Wine, we already said, is not relevant nowadays. So we're going to say just like wine isn't relevant. In other words, we're assuming they're talked about just the Kohanim shouldn't grow their hair long. We would assume any coin nowadays uh, would not be able to grow his hair long, no more than 30 days. But they say, no, we're going to compare it to drinking. Just like drinking, we limited, and we said it's only when the temple's around. We no longer have any reason, not we do have a reason, but in the end we said, it's okay, you can drink. So likewise, you can grow your hair. But the hot tanya, but wait a minute, doesn't it say in a brighter? 
אומר, רבי אומר, רבי סד, אומר אני, כהנים אסורים לשעות יין לעולם, אבל מה אעשה שתנקלתו כלכלתו? ואמר רבי, כמען שתו אינה, כהני חמרה, כרבי, וכהנים, drink wine, חמרה is wine, the כהני is the כהנים, drink wine, like רבי do nowadays, so what do you see? Now you see it's okay, but something important, רבי said this, מכלל, from here one can infer, to רבנן אסרי, that the rabbis forbade it. So now we have this situation where the rabbis clearly disagree about drinking. Maybe they also disagree about cutting hair. Okay, I won't tell this to all my family members. There are some of them who like to grow their hair long. It's one I can think about. So you're not allowed to do that, at least at certain times in his life. So my time, Mehera yibane beit hamikdash, ubi'ina koena ro'el avodah v'leika. Hacha efshar demesabra v'ayon. No worries. Even if the rabbis hold you can't drink wine, you still are allowed to grow your hair. Why is that? Because it's very easy to have a guy standing right outside the temple. Here come the Kaanim. The temple's rebuilt. Kaanim come. Give him a quick buzz. You know, you can give him a quick haircut and he'll be ready to go. It doesn't take very long. Whereas once you're drunk, it doesn't take, you know, a snap of a finger to get out of being drunk. So therefore, we're going to distinguish. Wait, if so, you can just go to sleep for a bit, take a little nap, and then you can go into the temple. As usual, they're not going to prove this from reality, that you can get sober by taking a little nap, but they're going to prove it from something Amora said. Walking a certain distance, a meal, which is around a mile, or a little bit of wine, a little bit of sleep, a short nap, will get out the wine. So there you have it. It's pretty easy to do that. And then you can go to the temple, no problem. So even wine should be a problem according to the rabbis. So the Gemara says, wait a minute. Love me, eat my Allah. Was it not said on that statement? Amar of Nachman, Amar of Bravua. Lo shanu ela kishe shata shiur rivi'it. Aval shata yotir rivi'it. Kol shaken shederach matrida to v'shena meshakarto. That's only if you ate a quarter of a log. But if you drank a quarter of a log, meaning a small amount of wine, if you drank a lot of wine, walking makes it worse, sleeping makes you more drunk, and therefore we're talking about drinking that larger amount, which is going to not be, the Kohen is not going to be able to quickly get over it. So that's why the rabbis, theoretically, right, Rebbe doesn't distinguish. He thinks it's not a problem at all anymore. But the rabbis who would say you can't drink wine would not have an issue with growing your hair long. Now we have another statement, uh, a different, sorry. Now we have another answer. Rav Ashi Amar, shduye yayin de machle avoda, gazru buhu rabbanan. Pure rosh, de lo machle avoda, lo gazru buhu rabbanan. Rav Ashi gives a different answer. And the Gemara is going to have a question on his answer, a uh, difficulty with it. But Rav Ashi says, what do you mean? Shduye yayin drinking is much more severe than growing your hair. And therefore, we're going to be strict with that. The rabbis instituted that even nowadays, you can't drink wine, but you still can grow your hair. Why is that? If you go into the, you're a Kohen, and you go in and you work in the temple when you're drunk, anything you did is disqualified. It doesn't work. But if your hair is long and you work, that's fine. You're not allowed to do it. And we're going to see in a minute that you get the death penalty for it, death in the hands of God. But it's still not going to be, it's still not going to disqualify your work. So now the Gemara is going to question that assumption that it doesn't disqualify your work. Metive, from a Tanaitic source. Metive is a question from a Tanaitic source on something in Amora said. So we're now going to question Ravash. Metive. Ve'eluhen shebimita. These people get the death penalty, death by the hands of God. Shtuye yayin rosh. Okay, both those who drink wine and those who keep, grow their hair if you're a Kohen. Man, I understand. It says, don't drink wine, and you really have to read the rest of that verse, which says, and then you won't die. So don't drink wine, you go do the work, and then you won't die. Okay, clear. If you do, you will die. But remember, it wasn't even in the Torah the, that you can't do it. We're going to quote, as it says in that Pasuk in Yechezkel that we saw before. Don't shave your head, but also don't let your hair grow long. And right after that, it says, When the Kohanim go into the inner chamber, they can't drink wine. 
So now we're going to do what's called a hekesh, two things that appear next to each other in the verses. It kush pure rosh the shtriyayin, ma shtriyayin b'mita, a pure rosh b'mita. Since the shtriyayin gets the death penalty, so does the Kohen who grows his hair long. In which case, that's the end of the brighter that we quoted. What are you going to assume from here? Once we make a hekesh, let's make a hekesh all the way. Meaning, umina, im ma shtriyayin demach le'avoda, a pure rosh demach le'avoda. Just like a shuyayai in his work is disqualified, the poor rorosh, the person who has long hair, should also have disqualified avoda. Now there's a section in parentheses, which says, parentheses usually means we should take this out, but there's a bit of a debate about whether we say this or not. Some people actually end with kashya. I have a different version. It says, this is in fact difficult for Ravashi, and maybe you really would be disqualified according to this if you had long hair in the temple. But... The text that appears here, which again, it's not clear if it was really the right text or not, says there's an answer. Look, and then we say, no, it's a partial hekesh. You can learn one thing, but you don't learn everything. Some people don't like this because they say there is no such thing. We have this concept, in hekesh the mechza. You can't do it part way. Either you do it and then you do it all the way or you don't do it at all. So maybe we have an answer. Maybe we don't have an answer. Again, this was all trying to say, What's the difference nowadays between drinking and growing your hair along that the rabbis distinguish? Again, Rebbe said, even nowadays, Cohen could drink. And it seems that we hold like that because I've never heard anyone say, but I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I haven't heard anyone say that Cohen actually can't drink. But according to the rabbis who hold the Cohen can't drink, they think Cohen can't drink, but they can grow their hair long. And that's because either it's very easy to fix that, where it's not as easy to fix someone who's drunk, Number two, right, in a quick manner, if the temple were to be rebuilt immediately, or what Ravashi says, which either gets rejected or not, which is in general, we see that drinking wine is more severe because not only do you get the death penalty, but it also disqualifies your avoda. You do get the death penalty for growing your hair long, but it doesn't disqualify any work you might do while your hair is long. And then, right, we're not sure if whether that's accurate or not based on the question against Ravashi. Amr le Ravina le Ravashi. Now, Ravina asked Ravashi the following question. Your whole, right, this bright had just said that it's all based on this verse in Yechezkel. So who said this before Yechezkel? In other words, what, did the Kohanim not, they could grow their hair long until Yechezkel came along and said they couldn't? Seems weird. All those years of the first temple, Yechezkel is around the time of the destruction. So, you know, all that time, the Kohanim were actually working with long hair. They didn't have this issue. So, so Rav Ashi says to him, if you want to ask that question, then you'll ask the same thing. Rav Chista said, Rav Chista said about a different thing. The following statement was not said in the Torah, but we learn it from Yechezkel, from the Nevi'im, Divrei Kabbalah is the prophets, and it happens to be another verse from Yechezkel. Any coin who doesn't have is not circumcised, is not allowed to go into the temple. That's an arel, okay? Not uncircumcised. Now, are you going to say, you're going to say, before Yechezka, what? Uncircumcised Kohanim did work in the temple? Can't possibly be. Ela, Gemara Gemirla, it must be a tradition. It must have been until he said it. It was, everyone knew by tradition. What did Yechezka do? He wrote it down in a verse but it clearly existed before by tradition. Hachanami, we could say the same thing by us. Gemara gemirla ve'ati yechezka v'asmacha ka. It was a tradition, but yechezka came and connected it to a verse. Now, again, we have in parentheses, we're going to ignore this part because it seems like it's really not part of the text. Although some people say, ki gemira halacha lamita, lachule avodo lo gemire, which is another kind of response to this, which is, Yes, we learn it for death, right? If we assume it's halacha l'mash misinai, then the halacha l'mash misinai is learned out from, um, from the death penalty, right? For the death penalty, but not for disqualifying the work. Okay, it seems like this doesn't really go with the flow so of the text, so we're not going to uh, read it. Those who learn Masechet Rosh Hashanah, this will be good review with a bunch of added things in it. But now we're going to say anything it says in Megillah Ta'ani, this is a list of special days that one is not allowed to fast. And some of them even it says you can't eulogize. So when it says you also can't eulogize, it's not only forbidden on that day, but also the day before and also the day after. Tanu Rabbanan. 
Brighta says, Elin Yomaya de Lo Litane Bahon. Okay, these are texts. It seems like this is from, interesting. I think, I'm assuming this is from Megillah Tani, but it seems like it appears in other places. These days you can't fast. Umiksatan de Lo Bahon. And some of them you also can't eulogize, just like we said before. So what's the first days they're going to discuss? Mireish Yarcha de Nisan, from the first of Nisan, Ad Tim Nayabe, until the eighth of Nisan. What happened? What was special? Remember, the Gilat Hanid is all these days that something unique happened that we want to celebrate. So we say you can't fast and you can't, possibly also you can't eulogize. So what happened? Itokam Tamida, the Tamid sacrifice was set in place. What does that mean? It was set in place before that. But Rashi explains, Shayuat Stukim Omrim, Yachim Nadevu Mevi Tamid. Okay, the Tztukim, remember there were Tztukim, we're going to talk a minute about the Baitusim, these different sects that believed didn't have the same rabbinic traditions as we did. And they said that an individual wants to bring a korban to me, they can. Why? They took the Torah literally. The Torah says, Et keves echad The first keves you should bring in the morning. And it says, ta'ase, ta'ase, those who know grammar, is one person, ta'ase. And then it says, you bring one in the morning, one in the evening, right? One lamb in the morning, one in the afternoon. It says, Tase in both places sounds like singular form. So to which the, the Maya Hajule, the Prushim came along and said, wait, we have a different verse. My sacrifice with its lechem, it's or like my, my food, right? my food, my food for God, um, to be burnt. This is God saying, my korban, my food, this is my food that you're bringing me. Be careful to observe. Notice it says tishmeru. Grammatically, that's plural form. So they said, look, we proved it has to come from communal funds. This is something we learned in Yoma. We learned it in Shkalem. I believe we learned it in Beit. So this idea that these things have to come from communal funds, things from the public funds, from the Trumat Alishka. Remember the money they would collect from the Machatzita Shekel. And you can't use individual money for communal sacrifices. So then he says, so that was the eight days that we had this argument and we won. So we're going to celebrate those days. Delo le mispet. Okay, you cannot um, fast. Delo le mispet bahon on the mitim neyabe from the eighth day of Nisan, ad self moada until the end of the holiday, itotiv chagadish shavuai. They established the holiday of Shavuot, what do you mean? Established in the Torah. But there was a big debate about how to understand, you might remember this, the Baitusim said that you're supposed to count seven weeks from the day after Shabbat, it says in the Torah, which the Baitusim said, it's literally the day after Shabbat, meaning whenever Pesach comes out, whatever day of the week, we're now going to go after the next Shabbat, meaning the first Sunday after Pesach, we're going to then count seven weeks from there, and at the end of that will be Shavuot. And the Prushim said, no, Mimachorata Shabbat means the day after the holiday, the first day of Pesach. We're going to start counting Sfarad Omer from there and end 49 days after that. The 50th day will be Shavuot. So between the eighth day of Nisan until the end of Pesach, they fought about this and then they won. Okay, they beat out the bites soon. They proved them wrong or they established it at least within the Prushi community. They everyone agreed with them. And therefore, Delo Lemispebohan, you can't do a eulogy on that day. So now we're going to go a little bit more in depth into this. Amar Okay, so that's just a quote. Why from the beginning of the month? You should just say from the second of Nisan until the eighth of Nisan. Why? Because Rosh Chodesh Gufa Yom the Rosh Chodesh anyway you can't eulogize because it's Rosh Chodesh. Any Rosh Chodesh you can't. Rav says the reason why we said from Rosh Chodesh is because we know, and that's what we read in the Mishnah, that the day before it is also forbidden. And that way you know that the last day of Adar is also forbidden. So now the Gemara asks, It should also be forbidden because this is the day before Rosh Chodesh. So you don't need to say from Rosh Chodesh. So the answer, no, that's not true. Rosh Chodesh Joel Raitu, when we learned this in Rosh Hashanah, since Rosh Chodesh is Doraita, now it's not really a holiday we Doraita, but it is mentioned in the Torah as a special day. It doesn't say in the Torah you can't fast and you can't eulogize, but it is established in the Torah as an important day. And therefore, Doraita lo bayechizuk. You don't need to strengthen something that says in the Torah. But Titania, um, as it says in a bright, 
לפניהם ולאחריהם אסורים. Anything מגילת תעני, because it's only rabbinic in nature, we're worried people won't take it seriously, so, and they might forget about it, so we make the day before and the day after to basically show this is super important. But Shabbatot, v'yamim tovim, הם אסורים ולפניהם ואחריהם מותרים. But when it comes to things that are written in the Torah, like Shabbat and holidays and Rosh Chodesh, there we're going to permit the days before and after. מה הפרש בין זה לזה? And here the bright approves exactly what we said. What's the difference? Halalu divrei Torah, v'divrei Torah ain't s'ruchim chizuk. These are Torah and they don't need any strengthening. But halalu divrei sofrim, v'divrei sofrim s'ruchim chizuk. We've seen this many times. That rabbinic law always needs strengthening because people might not take it seriously. So sometimes we have to be more strict with something that's rabbinic than something that's Torah. Obviously, somewhat contradicts the whole concept of suffix to right to the chumra and suffix to rabban and lekula, which is if you're in doubt about it, we always were more strict with rat with the Torah law. We're less strict with rabbinic law, but that's something different. That's if we have a doubt about something. This is sometimes there's rabbinic laws that we need to strengthen. Amar Mar, last part for today. Mitim naya be ad sof moade i totiv chaga de shavu aya de lo lemispet. So from the eighth to the end of the holiday, you can't do hespedim, right? No eulogies. Why would you say till the end of the holiday? Just say until the holiday. And then for the holiday, it becomes holiday. You can't do it because of the holiday. So the answer, sorry, that's part of the question. And the moed itself is a holiday and it's forbidden anyway. So just like Rav said before, we said Rosh Chodesh because we want the day before. Here we said till the end of the holiday so that you know that the day after will also be forbidden. Okay, and that's because of this thing that happened where they established Shavuot by the date that they wanted. And that's why it's a celebratory day that even the day after Pesach, you still can't fast or eulogize. And that's because it took all those days for them to establish it. And therefore all those days are considered days of celebration. With that, we will end for today. Nice to talk about celebrations on a day like Hanukkah when we start our celebrations. So there you have it. Another DAF connection. Okay, have a great day, everyone. And not to mention that Hanukkah is mentioned in the Gilata Ani. So also another connection to Hanukkah. Have a great day.